Okay, welcome everyone to Miracle Monday. And uh, today we're going, we have, we're dedicating today's session to a particular topic, which is the fifth stage of the development of trust. Um, and we're joining Louis Miguel Falqueo again today to explore this stage. We also call it the eye of the needle. Uh, the fifth stage, um, I got a little, little bit of a welcome here. I'm just going to read this out because this will give you a little indication and an introduction to today's topic. The fifth stage of the development of trust, or the eye of the needle, is a very specific stage that every mind will eventually go through. It has been described as a deep and rare stage of what could be called the realization of Christed being. It arises when ego as identity has been transcended, with only a tiny thread left, the one attached to any and all thought systems obstructing mind's great fear which is not knowing. To throw out all the mind's crutches and enter the eye of the needle towards the unknown and utterly unknowable, even as the reverberations of stuck and stark disorientation and terror strikes from stem to stern. This is the eye of the needle. Coming to love only God is the very gravitational pull that ensures its inevitable arrival. No one genuinely devoted to waking and transformation will avoid the eye of the needle in ripe time. Over the past four years, I have spoken to a number of companions. Now, this is me speaking now. So I've spoken to many teachers and students who have been through the eye of the needle or, or are in the middle of going through the eye of the needle. And I just compiled a couple of statements that just to give you an idea as to what can be experienced when you're going through this. So these are the statements. It can feel so dark that the Holy Spirit doesn't feel available to me. There are many times it felt as though every bit of sanity was being sucked out of my mind. During this time, you can appear to be normal, and you can be, but you can be in deep fear and even terror much of the time. When you're going through this stage and someone tells you to choose another thought, it's like telling the prisoner who is being pummeled down the sewer line in the Shawshank Redemption movie to choose another thought. And the other one is, it feels like a, my mind is being consumed by a vampire. Um, I've heard several teachers respond to someone going through the stage with a statement that you need to do more forgiveness work. But of course, as we know, nothing could be further than the truth. The reason the eye of the needle has come to you is because you have done a lot of forgiveness work. Um, and so basically, we are offering this Zoom session now because many more parts of the mind are starting this stage, and it feels like the appropriate time to offer this sharing. I also want to share what Lloyd said about the eye of the needle. He said, during this stage, it's not that the decision maker has chosen the wrong teacher and is suffering because of that. It's because the ego is so vicious, it doesn't want you to access the decision making mind. It's blocking you from choosing another teacher. So never feel guilty for not being able to choose again while you were in this stage of your journey. And I wrote a little poem about it and I'll just read it here. It says, the eye of the, eye of the needle is the last hurrah of the ego. It is a serenade and no love lost attitude of the ego. It cannot separ separate you from God who is your source and almighty counterpart in creation. This too shall pass. It is a brilliant promise from God himself. Mighty is the one who waits under the lapel of God's love for the storm to pass. And so for those of you who don't know Luigi, he hosts A Course of Miracle South Africa, which is a group dedicated to studying the non-dualistic mystical teachings of the Christ mind, so that we all remember that through forgiveness, we will knowingly be the one self who is the Holy Son of God. Okay, thank you. And uh, Luja, you can go ahead and unmute uh, yourself and we'll we're take on record, it from there. Yeah, we're on record. Thank you. Thanks once again for inviting me and um, and having the trust to 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 let me share a perspective because it's simply a perspective, and especially um, having gone through this these different stages on in the development of trust several times um i can only speak from and only share from a place of 
of direct experience, and that's what I'll do. So I'm going to take you through the actual passages in, in a few minutes, but I want to I want to really lay down this foundation. Um, Ken's ladder, we call it Ken's ladder, the ladder, the, you know, the steps up the ladder. At a certain stage, at the fifth step of the ladder, this is when you're really getting tempted. And 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 just like the game of snakes and ladders, we're, as we ascend into higher awareness, the ego isn't going to let you go gently into the night. It's going to attack you and attack you. The lighter you become, the fiercer the ego becomes. You know, the book of Jonah, for example, is a typical example of biblical fifth stage ascension. The important thing is the instruction given in the manual and, and reinforced in the manual for teachers. And I'll get into that. But what I want, I want you all to remember this. Imagine, if you will, for a minute, a lava lamp and it's it's switched off. And if you look at a lava lamp, there's a there's a blob of solidified goo at the bottom of the lava lamp when when the lava lamp is cold once you switch it on the little lava part starts to heat up and slowly floats to the top and as it reaches the you know further away from the globe at the bottom of the lava lamp parts of it cool down and then like little globs fall down to the bottom get heated up and go back up that's what's happening to us collectively. And what we need to realize, and this has to take the pressure of you, the purpose of what I'm saying is you have to take the pressure off of trying to reach some, some imagined state of enlightenment or awakening or atonement. There's no pressure because we are one collective whole, one dreaming mind. And the whole mind is heating up in the light of awareness, each one of us is contributing to the heating up. Each one of us is contributing to our collective awakening. And the mistake we make when we start traveling inward into a spiritual path, whether it be Advita or whatever non-dual path, Course in Miracles, is we start comparing ourselves to our imagined deity saviors, the Jesus characters, and we Imagine we have to be something. Now, it's important to realize when the mind fell asleep, it fractured itself into nine septillion parts. Where do I get that number from? 3,000 life between life regressions. 3,000 people under hypnosis all attested to nine septillion. The first time I heard nine septillion, I had to look it up. How many zeros are there? Okay, so... Look it up. I want you to go look up nine septillion okay, fractures of itself. And each fracture was a thought about what it could be. And therefore, every thought the dreamer had about himself went in a specific direction to try and find a way to return to joy, to return to happiness. But it wanted to return to happiness because inherently it is joyous peace. But it wanted to do so by making a fanciful experience. The direction that it moved away from source, God, is the exact same direction it comes back. Now, some followed a spiritual path away from God, believe it or not. And that's why spiritual path becomes their return home. Some did it through art. Some did it through music. And you've got to keep that in your back of your mind. Remember that none of us fractured parts of the mind awaken. The dreamer awakens. Every fracture realizes its true essential nature. It's God nature. It's what Jesus did. He realized the essence of himself and the essence of God are identical. And he realized that part of him that is true is the I am. And I am my father or one is the, the the realization that Jesus had, Yeshua, Christ Yeshua. So the minute he went into that realization, he started ascending in consciousness. And just before the crucifixion, he fully ascended in consciousness. Then he went through the resurrection. And to demonstrate to the rest of the disciples, he then vanished from existence, only to reappear much later and and teach again. But the point is that 
he realized the body mind doesn't ascend. The awareness enters the body mind identity and then takes over. And that that essence that enters us and reminds us of what we are, we call that Holy Spirit. It's the life force inside all of us. It is the God spark inside all of us. It's the part that returns to the dreaming mind, spirit world, first dream, once the body dies. It's the same part that returns and is projected into physical form. When that, when that segment, that fracture, fully self-realizes through the projected character, because it can only do it in duality. It cannot do it in the in the likeness of the first dream where the, where the secret sin, fear, and guilt is completely hidden. There's not enough polarity for us to realize as spirit that the secret is in the, in the dream. And so we have to incarnate in order to realize what we are through the experience of, when, of what we're not. And once that realization is, is fully realized, that which projected the false self ceases to exist. And the real self, the true self, the fragment of itself, it remembers itself as the essence energy of God returns to the right mind. And imagine, if you will, what is happening. And it's just an just a picture in your mind is imagine the right mind is pure light. Imagine two rooms split apart by a wall and between the two rooms, there's a door. When you open the door, does the darkness flow into the light or does the light flow into the darkness? You know the answer. You open the door between a lit room and a dark room, and the light flows into the dark room. And what is happening is the the the, the door is widening, and, or the walls are dissolving, and the light is flowing into the darkness. And so it seems as if the light is enlarging, and the darkness is shrinking. And so as the darkness shrinks, it intensifies, because it's getting smaller and smaller. So it seems to intensify it doesn't because it's not real but what is happening is the light is expanding and what we're all experiencing is a enlightening we're lightening up we're letting go of the heaviness the unbearable you know heaviness of not being and we're transcending into the infinite lightness of being being what our true one christ self the ever extending light love of god so Take away the, the heavy responsibility that you need to be anything but what you are. Because the ascension of self is not through behavior. It is through self-realization. It is through the abiding and the all-pervading presence in which we abide, God, always. It is a complete reunion. It's a reunion between you, Son, Christ, Self, and father you and it's a recognition that you've never left it's a you reuniting because like you wake up in the morning and your partner's lying next to you and it's not that you've been gone because you were sleeping it's just you see them again you're back you haven't left you realize i haven't left it's the knowing i am and it's the knowing that the i am is the silent stillness thoughts no longer capture you now, of course, they're going to intensify in the, first, in the fifth stage. Why? Because the ego is realizing you're no longer playing its game. And so it's going to find all those vulnerabilities you once had, which you've already transcended. But it's going to bring them back and try and tempt you again. And that's really the, it's like when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane and the devil tried to tempt him. You know, And of course, the devil isn't a dude with horns and a tail. The devil must have come in a nice little low top red dress you know, sort of very short skirt, high heel shoes, lipstick, makeup, and probably smelled like roses and said to him, I'll show you paradise. And what did Jesus say? Get behind me, Satan. Get behind me, Lord. It's, and it's, and, you know, we have this, this idea that, you know, we're going to speak in gentle tones. Get behind me, thought. No, get behind me, thought. No, absolutely not. I have not given you permission to, to come into my awareness. Step away. I see you. You're not real. No, thanks. Do not let them capture your, your attention. You are aware of being aware. Don't let the thought pull you into, into struggles. And at some stage, you're aware that you're aware and you know nothing. 
and get comfortable with not knowing because what is there to know? True knowing is of the self. And while we're in body-mind, we have glimpses when we're completely silent and completely still and offering gratitude, true prayer, gratitude. And all that, that, that essence energy of God flows through us. And while we abide in it, it's totally peaceful. And as it flows, it extends. And that peace becomes love. And what happens? We start to see the face of Christ everywhere. What is that? Are we seeing Jesus everywhere? No. We're, we start to recognize within everything we see is love. Everything becomes an echo for the voice for love, for the voice of God. We realize everything, the essence energy of everything cont contains the holy essence, which is God. And in the non-dual traditions, people like to speak of consciousness and, and awareness. Now, consciousness is the realm of the dreaming mind. Nothing, nothing in the entire universe has consciousness. Nothing. You don't have consciousness. You have to realize this, or well, the fit level is going to be difficult. You appear in consciousness. Right. You don't have consciousness. And when you return to awareness, you don't have awareness. You are awareness. You, do you feel that? Do you feel the truth? I get asked, does a cat have consciousness? No, nor do you. Does a dog have consciousness? No. We appear in consciousness. It's like you dream at night and you've localized yourself into your dream. Does the character that you've localized yourself as in your dream have consciousness? No. He appears in dream consciousness. You're experiencing your dream consciousness through the activity appearing as you, as a character in your dreaming mind. We are activities of the dreaming mind through which it experiences itself. That's why the non-dualist like Rupert Spira, and I love him, but he makes one fundamental mistake. He says, God is dreaming. Right. No, he's not. Because if God was dreaming, okay, forgiveness hats on, ready? If God was dreaming, we would be fucked. Because then who would wake us up? Whoopsie. If God was dreaming, this would be forever a dream. Thank God. Thank God. It's only one, one, one fracture of God, which is fracture. One aspect of God, his son, fell asleep. And God calls the rest to waken up. Now, God is pure awareness, or as in Advita, they, they refer to it as pure consciousness, or Rupert talks about Rup, um, pure consciousness. But I like to use the word awareness for the mind of God, pure awareness. Now, the closest we get to awareness is bridge consciousness, which is what happens straight after the development of trust, the fifth layer. We move into awareness. And, and while we're in the fifth level, we're touching on awareness. And what is awareness? Well, if I was to explain to it, I'd be talking utter shit. Because you can't explain awareness while I'm trapped in body-mind. How can I explain? I can explain consciousness, and it's a concession because I am an activity of consciousness. Trying to reach pure awareness. Not there yet. For if I wasn't pure awareness, this is how I would explain it. Feel that? It's you. So everything is now becoming a reflection of the love we are. Now this gets dedicated. Once upon a time, it was used as a device to prove to God we could usurp his power. Now it's used as a device, an instrument to bring the word of God, the truth, through example, through living example to the rest of our fractured selves. Now, we're only responsible for our own fractured atonement. But once the atonement's done, what do you do? Do you just return? While you're still here, many of us think we still got work to do. 
Yes, we do, but it doesn't mean that you still need to continue doing forgiveness work. Sometimes it's now time you've done the forgiveness, bring the light back in, be the servant of light. Yes, occasionally you'll still have to practice forgiveness, but what you really should be doing is pouring the love of God through your passionate, talented nature, your talents back into the world. Because what happens to people when they lose a sense of purpose? Something inside starts to die. You, see, you hear about it all the time. CEO quits his high-powered job, and two years later, he's dead. What happened? He had no more purpose. So it's the same thing. What's our job been for so many years, everybody on this community? What's your main job been for so many years? You've been seeking to remember self. Now you get to that realization, I remember self. What do you now do? Do you retire? No, now you share self. This is a period of deep investigation, of direct contemplation, direct communication, abiding in silent stillness, in deep communion with our source, our true self. And what we're doing is we're asking to be shown anew, show me a new way. This is the St. Francis prayer. Where would you have me go? To whom would you have me serve? To what would you have me say? This is now our prime. If you really want to transcend the fifth level, it means move into service. It means now go share. Because the minute you try and hide from it, yes, there's times to be reclusive, to go recharge. But your journey towards God is complete. You see, once the journey away from God ends, the journey back to God commences. But once we've reached, once we've returned back to God, now our journey with God starts. And that's what the fifth stage is trying to ask us to do. Commence your journey with God. This is now a journey of, of service. So as, as, as the Course says in in the development of trust, the fifth, you know, the fifth, st fifth stage is the next stage is a period of unsettling. Why? Because we have no cooking clue what to do with ourselves. So we like imagine we're just going to go sit, retire, sit on a mountain, pray all day long. It's not enough. You're the light of the world. You don't take a beautiful bright light and hide it in a cupboard. You bring it into the darkest rooms. You're now go. You're asked to go where angels fear to tread. Love that. Okay, you're now asked to go where the, the because you've, you've gone through the darkest night of the soul plenty of times, and this is not the darkest night of the soul. This is, this is a, a drop in the ocean in comparison to dark night in the soul. You're now asked to go into the darkness with courage and conviction, knowing you are the light. Now you need to realize, now the teacher must, of God must understand he did not really know what was valuable and what was valueless. Because you don't know shit. We don't know anything. We, we get at that point and realize I don't know anything. Put down the book. Put down the course. Put down all purposes. But you do realize that what you really want was, you didn't want the valueless. People, places, things, and events. What you wanted was the real connection. Why do any of us follow a course in miracles or follow a spiritual path or go to retreats because we want to return to the joyous peace we are our, our infinite lightness of being why because it calls us to be ourselves knowingly and that's the valuable now how do you know you're the light of the world you offer the light of the world you become consciously while we're in dream consciously Awake to self, awakening to self, bridge consciousness, and now we go and serve. And how do we serve? We show up. We show up, especially where we didn't want to go. What do you hear nowadays? Oh, I went to so and so. The place is so toxic. The place, these people are so toxic. If people are toxic, the toxicity is in you because you're only seeing what you are. So you now want to be reminded of what you are. You're starting to see the face of Christ everywhere. Everything becomes an echo for the voice of God. And now you go present the voice. Remember, you try to sort this out and your own sorting out was completely meaningless. I know. What did I do? I went and got rid of my motorcycle collection. It was crazy. 
Motorcycling was an expression of my joy. I've rebuilt it all again. I'm loving it now. I love the expression. I I love to do Children's Day where I give kids rides and I go and do charity events. And it becomes an instrument whereby I am able to bring the light into this world. Mm -hmm. The idea of sacrifice so central in our own thought system actually made it impossible for us to judge. Yet we judged all the time, but what were we judging? Because who is there to judge and what is there to judge when the whole damn thing is an illusion and even the appearance of a judger is no is not true? We could not judge anything because there was no one or nothing to judge. You think you're judging. There's no you judging. The judgment is happening through you by the mind asleep. And then you take that judgment as if you are. Mm. Yeah, it's so true. Do you remember this? If there's anything you remember from me, is this. You don't have an ego. What did he say? You do not have an ego. But you have a Holy Spirit. Yet this ethereal thought stream that isn't real, ego, has tried to convince that which is real, that you are it. You are not ego. You are pure spirit. You've never had an ego. You just mistakenly thought you did. And you thought that, and because you thought it did, you thought you thought, and actually it was it thinking through you. It isn't real. You are. And he thought he thought he thought he knew what willingness was for, but now you realize that you don't know what it is. Your willingness is I will to will thy will. And what is God's will? To return to being yourself knowingly. And how can you be yourself knowingly unless you're being yourself knowingly? And being is sharing and extending. Go share. Now, don't give up your day job and now you have to become a spiritual teacher. Do it exactly where you are, but do it vigilantly. The path of self-mastery isn't a lonely one. The path of self-mastery is the only one. And that means vigilance. Keep your lanterns burning because the thief always comes in through the back door in the darkest night. And so vigilance. And that means, and it's it, this is what's so simple and yet we don't recognize it. And this was my transcendence process. I had war thoughts going on, abuse, anger. It was just discrimination. I had hundreds and thousands of real intense attack thoughts throughout my life. And when I started saying no to the thoughts and returning to silence, the silence is the essence energy of our true self, holy self, memory for God, holy spirit. And when we abide in silent stillness, the holy water of truth, the, the, the pain, the sin, the fear, the guilt dissolves. We try and brush it and clean it. You just How do you clean the paintbrush? You dip it in water. And you just leave it in the water and, and the paint just melts off the brush. And the next thing you've got a clean brush. And sometimes it needs to be wriggled around, just like sometimes we need to be shaken by the ear so that the paint of the remnants of our fractured body mind identity which is ego which isn't real is cleansed off us but you're going to be shaken if you're hanging on to the identity and especially the role that you thought you should have played and the ones that are the most difficult to get rid of and i've watched this in the community are those that started to derive a sense of li li livelihood by being spiritual teachers because you get to the point and you realize Spiritual is just a concept. I just need to be myself. But hang a second, I've spent my whole life making money by teaching spirituality. What do I do now? You continue to teach, but you now just teach vigilantly. That's it. You just now do it realizing you teach to remember. You're not teaching to help anyone. There's no one to help. There's only the atonement of self. Yes, you may seem like you're helping others, but it's all for self. And the others are just reflections of you that you can then, whereby you're measuring your own real self-realization. And now he remains in a state 
that 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 may remain impossible to reach for a long, long time. Hang a second. He must attain a state that is impossible to reach a long, long time. Fuck that. Seriously, fuck that. No, 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 no. No, 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 absolutely not. We're not going to reach it in a long, long time. We're going to reach it right now. Because why? Because right now is where we are. We're here now. Now is another word for God. It's a decision. It's a decision we make to let the identity go, to no longer pay attention to thought. And every time the thought temptation goes, it's no thanks. And it's going to get intense. It's going to make you want to veer off the road and crash into a wall. And it's going to feel like it's attacking you when you're sleeping at night. And it's just to laugh at it. You've got to come out of it with laughter. You've got to laugh at it. A shadow cannot stand the light. And light is laughter. Lightheartedness is laughter. So after every single attack thought, after every single attack episode, you choose to laugh again, Holy Son of God. It's a decision for right-mindedness. And, and and lay all judgment aside. Well, that's not easy, but that doesn't mean that you don't try. And to lay judgment aside is to catch yourself. And what's the distance between losing your shit at a thought or somebody else appearing in front of you and catching it? That's the distance between you and self. That space time's an illusion. And the quicker you catch it, the closer you are. And guess how close you are? You're closer than close. You just switch off the channel. You switch off the radio and you realize I'm already here. Lay the judgments aside, especially the judgments that you haven't reached wherever you think you need to go. The reality of this awareness now is you've already reached a, a, a state in realization that 99% of spirit and spirit world is not aware of. Do you realize that spirit in the spirit world can no longer see you when you reach a certain level of conscious awareness? The fragments that are still in the spirit world, no longer, they've lost the awareness of you because you've moved into a higher realm. Remember this, when you take your final yade vade breath, is I, I have now chosen peace. There's nothing to return to but God. You, you cannot return to the spirit world when you've already realized this is dream. And if you were to return to the spirit world with the realization that your dream, none of spirit and spirit world, fractured parts of you, are going to recognize you because you've already transcended the identity of separation. So lay all judgment aside about yourself not having reached some sort of level that you imagine Jesus did. Remember, most of the stuff that's written about Jesus is people's imagination in the way that they thought they needed to behave had they attained some level. You have no idea. Remember, Jesus back in his day was a rebel. Where do you think they get the name Hell's Angel from? He was the angel in hell. He shook this tree upside fucking down. He gave this world a hiding of biblical distortions. He really shook it up. He completely annihilated all faith systems in the day. He shot holes in all of it. He pissed them all off that they wanted to murder him. Why? Because he spoke the truth. And it says, were not each step in this direction so heavily reinforced, it would be very hard indeed. Reinforced with what? Be thyself knowingly. Lay judgment aside. There is no one to judge. There is no one judging. There is no thing to judge. There's just the appearance thereof. And we're not the appearance thereof. We're not identifying with appearance, these ethereal, uh, hallucinogenic, uh, fractured appearances. We're not that. We are that which observes all of it. And that which observes all of it is the I am. <clears throat> and it, it attaches itself to the appearance, to the projection. It is I am this and I am that. Just one step inwards, one step backwards, through the doorway to infinity, and I am itself dissolves, and the silent, joyful light of God extends, and we are ourselves knowingly. You're already there. 
the fifth stage beats you up because you haven't recognized you're already at the sixth stage. So you've been so used to being not good enough, believing that you're the sinner and that you, hey, you've had a dream, you've woken up, it's already over. You're watching it on replay. What else do you want to know? Put down the mic, drop the mic. Now, the course doesn't use the word surrender. Okay. It was written 40 years ago. We've evolved. Why didn't it use surrender? Because to the initiate, to the new student, surrender was hectic. And often surrender is the white flag and we see it as giving up or failing. This isn't surrender as in you've given up. This is a surrender as in I've embraced. I will to will thy will. I surrender to your will because your will is the willpower of the infinite lightness of being. I will to will thy will, the light of God extend through me. True surrender after alignment is I now choose to serve myself through the infinite lightness of the awareness I am. I think I spoke about it yesterday that if we had only spelt it correctly instead of Christian and called it Christ, I am Christian, I Christ, I am. This world would have accelerated. We wouldn't have had a Bible to read. We would have awoken to the ascension of self so much quicker in our own awareness because it's already over. But while we hear, we hear because we're those, we're the messengers. What's a messenger? wingless angels that have chosen to come and be the service, bring the word, bring the light through our actions and our deeds. We stay stuck in the fifth stage and we feel unsettled because we don't admit to self. We don't have ego. We are pure spirit. And I choose to, and I realize, and I recognize, how do you realize, how do you have that period of, of pure achievement? Gratitude, gratitude, gratitude. Gratitude begets more gratitude. Here is learning consolidated. What does it mean? And now the refinement process happens. I've noticed myself refining, refining, refining. I mean, I've refined the fuck word so well that I can say it in six different languages. <laughs> I'm joking, holy son of God. Lighten up. You know, take me so seriously. Light. It's light. Okay. When I'm realizing I'm 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 refining, I'm refining, I'm refining. What was consciousness and higher co is now consciousness, bridge consciousness, awareness. I, I'm finding words to 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 make spirit, spirit, energy, palatable, essence, like vanilla, vanilla essence, the vanilla essence of God. I smell it, I breathe it, I, I share it, I extend it. Essence, energy, extension. These are words that are touching people that have never heard the course. It's, it's, we use, I mean, what was Nietzsche? You know, if you really want to teach, use folly. And sometimes you just use the, the rogue cowboy persona. You just play with it and you, and you, and you're giving people permission to, it's okay to be fucked up and to smoke cigarettes and drink Jack Daniels and ride a motorcycle and smack a cat. It's okay. I mean, I don't mean like a kitten and four-legged furry type. I mean, you know, just it's okay <clears throat> because we get so heavy with ourselves. And there's a wonderful word in Afrikaans called skein heilig, holier than thou. And we want to post pretty pictures of ourselves smiling. Fuck it, if I smile, I look like I'm about to kill something. You know, be true to self. <laughs> be true to self. And, you know, I mean, just just here you are. Just yeah, You know, it's yeah. And you show up and you be authentic. Like I've said before, be authentic to your nature, to this egoic nature, to be authentic to the character. And by authenticity to the character, you'll realize the layers like an onion that no longer serve you. 
and those layers will come off. The humor remains. Uh, my humor is not the nine o'clock news. Uh, my humor is British, English. I was raised with English humor, faulty towers, you know. And so the humor still comes out, the play on words, onomatopoeia, sarcasm, irony, it plays. It's not serious. It can't take anything serious. I'm uh, always being asked, don't you take anything serious? My answer is nope, unless it's ice cream. <laughs> I take ice cream very seriously. You know, it's like heaven in your mouth. And it's just, just go, go easy. I mean, hey, stop helping the, the, the false ego the non-existent ego, stop helping the ego. Because what do you do? You beat yourself up. The ego says, thanks for that. You make my life a lot easier because, you know, I don't have to work so hard. You beat yourself up a lot harder than I do. And so all of this lead me not into temptation is not to judge self and others, but it starts at home. We become so wonderful Course in Miracles students. Uh, don't judge, you know. Hell, don't even have a comment. Hell, don't have an opinion because it's judgmental. Well, in that case, then be completely quiet. But if you're going to share something, just share authentically and have some fun and pull the piss out of it. And what do we do? We beat ourselves up. No, you mustn't say anything. Uh, but, but hey, you're judging. Well, you've just judged me for judging. See? See how heavy we get? That thing that makes you beat, that makes your heart beat. The very thing, the reason you're watching me right now. The thing that's triggering your brain to trigger your your, cort your central cortex, which beats your heart and gets your lungs to work and pumps the blood through your veins. That, beloved siblings, is God. It's closer than close. It's within you. It is in you. It is you. Extend it. And the fifth stage becomes fun. It becomes a kick-ass stage. And before you know it, you're celebrating. You're celebrating the son. The prodigal son has awoken in his father's kingdom. And now, while appears to be replaying his dream, shares the light of self with the rest of himself. Not to force them to awake and not to preach to them awake, not to advise them awake, to laugh himself awake with the rest of them. Laughter. Laughter. And the Son of God remembers to laugh. That's it from me. Beautiful. Beautiful. <laughs> All right. Now we're gonna we're gonna address some questions, but I'm I'm feeling like we should take a 10 minute break before we and? well like if you take five minutes, five minute break before we how does that grab you? Yeah, it's perfect time to smoke a cigarette. Okay, awesome. So we'll come back here in five minutes, guys. All right, I'm going to put the recording on pause. See, we see you back in five. Okay. Okay, hey, welcome back. So, um, Lou, are you okay now with addressing some questions? Discussion? Of course, yeah, sure. Okay, if anybody has anything specific they would like to ask uh, Lou, and um, maybe I can get the ball rolling here. <clears throat> mm. I I have to sort of articulate it a little bit in my mind, but I just want to maybe dive a little deeper into, you know, you mentioned, I, I really appreciated the spirit of what you talked about. And I really got a lot out of it because I right now am going through the fifth stage of the development of trust. And I feel like I'm going through my final fifth stage. And maybe you can uh, delve a little deeper into that. You explained it yesterday about how we repeat the stages you know, we'll yeah. like as a cycle kind of a thing. Uh, and then, I, I okay, so that's the first part of my question. The second part of my question is, can you maybe talk a little bit more about how to be the light or whatever, um, extend God's love while you're going through that? Because like with myself, I've had like some pretty intense and devastating thoughts, uh, really severe ego attacks. And sometimes it's difficult, although I am moving forward uh with my journey so i just thought maybe because i know a lot of people are going through that it's almost like it's almost like it, it can become like a mental health issue it can get really debilitating so i just wanted to to talk about yeah. it. 
well, the whole the whole universe is one monumental biblical mental health issue, full stop. I mean, what the hell were we thinking? You know, <laughs> we weren't. <laughs> it's a silly little dream, but okay. Um, to me, some of you may know, I spent the last part of 30 years really delving into the different schools of, of, of thought, the different disciplines and 25 years ago, really, I, I, I started finding the, the non-dual paths and I really went down many a non-dual path and, and having studied architecture, I got into sacred geometries and a lot of the symbology in, that you find in the Kabbalah tree of life, the Egyptian book of the dead, um, the Tao Te Ching, the I Ching, we're, we're starting to become pointers, you know, um, the, the golden meat, golden triangle. And one of the symbols that really stood out for me was the Oromburus, the snake that um, swallows his own tail. And it, it bothered me. It, something was wrong about it. And I happened to visit the the uh, king's chambers in, in the pyramids of Giza um, with a phenomenal man, um, Zachariah Sitchin, when he was still alive. Um, Wow. And it was at the time of writing my second book when I was delving into the mysteries of the ancients. And I saw a depiction on one of the walls where the Uramburus was actually a coiled spring. And the recognition was that when you look at it straight on, it looks like he's swallowing his tail, but he's not. He's a coiled snake, of course, with his mouth open. But you look at him head on, it looks like he's swallowing his tail. And that just showed me the, the 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 reality of space time. Now we all know the story of the of the straw. You know, we 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 seem to be born here and we travel through time, but the reality is that we're not just traveling through time. We're always here now. We're always here now. But the next lesson that you need to realize is you're not just traveling in that direction. You're spiraling like a coil. It's like the season. You know, and of course, the reality of it, if you want to depict it properly, is actually this is turned that way around. You're actually you're ascending in a coil, and so you're going through the seasons. You're going through, you're going through ebbs and tides. You're going through the flow. You're going through the mutable laws of the dreaming mind, and you're releasing them. You're starting to see the synchronicities between the mutable laws. I spoke about them last night, so watch that one. Um, Secrets of the obvious night uh, chapter. Uh, series nine and i i speak about the the mutable laws of, and you're starting to see the synchronicities and the intertwining of all of them so realize that we're going through we're we're like hovering and we're picking up the thermal light of ascension so you're going through the levels so you're going through level one two three four five you touch on six and you think you've got it and next thing you're you're going through it again at the next level of consciousness and so there's these series of one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six. And then there's the final one. And when's the final one? You'll know. It's the letting go. And the final one is the most intense. And that's where we start to where we start to pull into ourselves the, the divine masculine and the divine feminine start coming together. And then that final incarnation is two separate identities. Um they merge into one, two by two, walk into the ark. And in their next projection, should they want to, should they don't need to, should they want to, those two will project into one, one BA. And they come through as the avatars. They come through as the teachers. The pull between masculine and feminine is gone now. The need for, you know, 11 minutes and sticky bits is gone. There's no need for that. Shag, marry, kill's gone. They come and they could be completely devoted prayer. If we didn't have so many of them up in the Himalayas and in the temples and in the mosques and in the and in the monasteries in full dedication and prayer, this world would simply turn into one monumental disaster, complete war nonstop. It's the prayer in the world by these monasteries and these monks that are there in total solitude and continuous prayer that keep us in some semblance of normalcy, if that's the right word to use for this world. So realize that you're going through these stages and you think you've got it. And before you know it, it's you're refining it. You're, it's the next level up. And of course, there's unforgiven thought. But 
But again, realize you don't have ego. You're practicing forgiveness for the collective. Please listen to Dr. Liu, Liu, he, Liu, Liu Hen, who the Ho'oponopono teacher. You know, he's done his forgiveness work, but it doesn't stop because you're doing the forgiveness work for the collective whole. So don't keep believing that it's your unforgiven stuff. That's what Course in Miracle students do. You've transcended much of this. And then something happens and you think it's mirroring your unforgiveness work. It's our collective unforgiveness work. Your individual, your individual forgiveness work has been transcended the minute you realized self and God are one. It's done. But you still appear here. And through your appearance of service, the continuing, I'm sorry, please forgive me. Thank you for showing up. I love you. We are healed. And you continue with that with that mantra internally. It's a continuum because you're practicing forgiveness for all of it. The minute you personalize the forgiveness and you think it's your ego again, you're straight back down to level one and you have to start ascending again. So be lighter on yourself. Don't carry this heavy burden. And how? How do I do this? Well, you're all born with a certain nature, propensity to do something. It's easy to notice the musician, the artist, um, the, 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 the person who wants to help heal, the doctor, the nurse, the social worker. They've got this calling. Um, hey, you could be an accountant. You, you're using the numbers. You're, you're bringing peace of mind to people by giving them stability when you're bringing them proper numbers and showing them where to spend and not spend. The architect, the, the lawyer, just play, but be vigilant. Be vigilant. Can you imagine? You know, you get at a certain level and now you say, oh, I've got to give up this life and now become spiritual. I tell a story of this wonderful lady who came to see me and someone told her she had healing hands. She was a concert pianist. One of the most famous South African concert pianists. She was going to give up playing piano to go and learn how to do Reiki and hands-on healing. Thank God she found me. And I said, are you mad? When you play piano, you heal thousands of people. You bring them into presence. You bring them into peace. We heal. We heal only when we're present. Don't give up your day job. Your passionate, talented nature is the very way you ran away from God. You're going to go back just like Hansel and Gretel. You're going to follow your breadcrumbs straight back to the source. Be true to self. Be true to your nature. Not everybody was, does take a David Hofmeister. David Hofmeister was born to teach. Now, can you imagine I try to be and sound like David Hofmeister? I would fuck it up properly. Properly. <laughs> properly. I'd smile and a growl would come out. This just wouldn't work. You know, David walks into a room, lights up the place. I walk into the room, the demons go scurrying. <laughs> We've got our different roles to play, you know. Mothers hug their babies and grannies hide behind the, the walls. It's it's We play a different role. The minute you think, oh, I have to play this way, it doesn't come through authentically. And what the world right now needs is authentic light, Thank the you. lightness of being, the infinite. That's the title of my next book, the infinite lightness of being, the smile, the gentleness that comes through in your way. And also sometimes... The one that walks into the room and says, no, not under my watch. You're not going to do that. Not yet. Bugger off. And sometimes that's called for too. And then don't go beat yourself up. Oh, I should have been gentler. No, no. That's what was needed right there and then. You know? And it's okay. It's okay. I find myself getting the motorcycle, go somewhere. Next thing I, I bump into... Another lone, lone ass biker. We said, have a conversation. <clears throat> I, I'm always being asked, how come you're always just so happy? What's wrong with you? Why are you so happy? This country's going to shit. There's no electricity. There's no power. Politicians. How come you're so happy? I'm like, hey, dude, we're just riding our motorcycles. Let's focus on what love is and not what's wrong. And the next thing he lights up and he lightens up and we're on our motorcycles and we're having fun. That's it. Show up. And 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 take the heaviness, you know, 
Steve does his, where's Steve? There's Steve. I see Steve. Steve does his talks. I laugh. I just, I go watch Steve just to laugh. Pulls the piss out of all of it. You can't stop laughing when you listen to Steve. You know, he's like a machine gun preacher, but just cause some miracles. It's fantastic. Be that. Be yourself. You know what we do? We judge ourselves. We measure ourselves up against other teachers, which we think are holy. You find in, in the law of, of the mutable law of, of, of your teachers are your polarity. They polarize you. You'd be attracted to the polarized teachers, the ones that are, are showing you what you are through the experience of what you're not. Just be yourself. They, the world needs you just as you are. It's very good. Just as you are. And that's actually very important. Like that's not a cliche. Because you know, you can you can sometimes, I mean, and I've talked to lots of people, including myself, I've experienced all of this, but you feel so down on yourself. Yes. That all of a sudden you're unsure of yourself. Yeah. What you're, and I under, so I understand exactly what you're saying. You just have to get out there and just be yourself and just be yourself no matter where you are, whether you're brushing Absolutely. your teeth or talking to, you know, some friends, whatever. Absolutely. And I just like to say, like what you discussed yesterday really helped me about the fact that the ego can get physical with you. Oh, yeah. Like, oh, absolutely. I, you know, I've tried to explain this to some people and they just think that, oh, you know, just change your thoughts, all that kind of shit. That's that's not true. It, it, it happens. I've gone through it. The intensity of the body-mind identity in with which it, it poured itself away from God is the same intensity the ego comes back at you. And you know, when I was going through that phase, that that serious, intense phase, it was a serious attack. And people look at me and say, like, are you on drugs? Never taken a drug in my life. Right. You know, are you drinking some? Well, you know, I joke about alcohol. I don't touch the stuff. You know, um, I mean, I joke about Jack Daniels because it goes the brand, but actually I don't drink. Um, yes, I've had a few, but I barely touch alcohol. The point is that the intensity, remember, it's all thought. You are a thought in form. What is ego? It's thought stream. It's a thought stream form. And so how are you going to experience thought in form while you're informed of thought? You're going to experience it with the intensity of a tsunami. It's going to hit you. And it's going to be, it's going to be hard. You know, it's not oh, just it's just gentle thoughts bugging me. It is intense. And I mean, 90% of the course community, we're empaths. We feel intense stuff. Of course, there's those that, that follow Gyani, they follow the intellect. Those are the ones that bring through word, that bring through the knowledge through word. But who are the ones that serve through bhakti, through devotion, the empath? It's hell. I can't imagine. I'm so grateful that I have more jnani than I have empath in me because I can I can rationalize it away and I can transcend it through reason. But those of us that are, those of you specifically that are just hot, it's intense and it brings you down. And then you get confused because then the course says things like there's no secrets in the mind. Okay, so let's share our problems. No, yeah. that's not what you're doing. When you share your problems, you make it real, and now you share it with everybody as if it's real. No, no, it's no thanks to the thought. No secrets in the mind. What's the secret of the mind? We're all mind, and not a single thought, but the thought of love is true. So we don't share our stupid thoughts. We transcend them by realizing the only thing that's true while we're appearances of body-mind is the silent stillness. And that's what we bring in. And how do we bring in silent stillness through word, through the joyous lightness of being lighthearted, kind word, kindness, compassion, validation, to bring each other in, to pull each other in to, hey, if I had to judge myself for being different from any other course teacher I've seen, I wouldn't say anything and you wouldn't be animated tonight. Yes. That's it. Yes. And, and so I know I know shit. I don't know anything more than any of you. I don't know anything in actual fact. I just know I'm stark raving fucking mad. That much I know. Because well, I must have been to dream this shit up. <laughs> Surely. 
All right. Do we want to? And yeah. So yeah. So if that's the final message, is just be yourself. Yes. And hey, it's more than okay. It's perfect. It's a really important message, and which goes deeper than you know, which goes deeper than it looks, so to speak. Okay, Fran, go ahead and unmute yourself. Okay, well, now I'm totally screwed. Good to hear. I know. Uh, well, first of all, this idea of, well, uh, the authentic, the authentic, um, uh, I got this message this morning around the lesson, Jesus saying, pay attention to the discomfort because that's my clarion call for you to see things differently. In other words, that's always my friend. That's always, always, always my friend. Okay. So I, I'm starting to get that. Uh, this authentic, that was interesting. Um, in the 12-step program, there's a little slogan that says, do you want to be good or do you want to be real? And it took me a long time being a major people pleaser. I didn't know my ass from page eight about who I was. The, um, that week that we're learning what I'm learning what I am by learning what I'm not, um, is, was important. It's important. Um, this authenticity, I have beaten myself up once I got, you know, prior ACIM, this idea of finding your voice, you know, um, basically saying fuck off when you really want to say fuck off instead yeah. of making nice. So with that being said, I'll just say this. Oh my God, you smoke. <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> I'm just, I'm just having fun with that. But anyway, this authenticity, I uh, in the story, in the dream world, I had to evict my grandchildren's mother when they were there. And I all but kicked down the door. I got so sick of it. And then for the last couple of years, you know, I go in and out of, oh, my God, I should have dealt with that differently. I should have this and that and this and that. And um, and and basically uh, and many other things that, quote unquote, I wished I hadn't done. But I wrote this script so I'd learn things. So I, you know. And I don't even know what all that means. Um, but this tightrope between being authentic and not being, you know, not trying to be this good ego student, this good ego, this um, is tough. It's tough because of the guilt. Hold on a minute. So back to this, look at the discomforts. So even when I'm kicking down doors and saying, get the frick out of here, or I'm not having that anymore, or bending over backwards, because I really do want to give all of this to you. It's okay. You don't have to pay me back. That's authentic sometimes too. You know what I mean? It's what is it that I really want? I don't know if I'm making any sense or not, but if I'm listening to that, and not trying to put it in some kind of box. Okay, so. Uh, There's two things you have to drop right away. Mm -hmm. That's going to just lift such a load off you. You did not write the script. Okay. The script was written by our collective mind, and you are a character that was written into the story. Okay. Your only responsibility is to realize that the character that is playing out you is not responsible for any of it. 
because none of it's real. That's it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So take the load off. And take that load off. I'm not responsible. The only thing I'm responsible for is to realize this isn't true. And so at every point of decision, I could see peace instead of this. Help me see this a different way. And when you genuinely act from, when you genuinely kick down the door from a place of love, because you realize if I let them keep playing this way, they're never going to learn to stand on their own two feet. And so I act from a place of love. I act from a place of tough love, but there's no vindictiveness or hardness. I'm just acting from a place of love. You know, I had to do that many years ago. I had to kick my brother in, and my, my sister-in-law out of the house and um, because they were just freeloading and they just weren't getting off their asses. Today, they both got a successful business, a beautiful daughter. Be I have a beautiful niece and, and they turn back and they are grateful. Okay. But, you know, it came from a place of I realized I'm just not letting them extend the love they could be because I'm keep I, I need to be the person who saves them. So I'm keeping them here. I need this reaction. I need to save. I need to look after. And then I complain that people are using me. Either I'm going to be okay that I'm the one that's providing for everybody and then I don't complain about it or I'm willing to dish out the tough lessons and not beat myself up about it. You have two choices. As in the eighth step, the choice is, do I act from a place of love or do I surrender into it and accept it? Well, I don't think when I, I, I felt very hard and clear when I kicked the door down, so to speak. It was just the, you know, the after uh, for a while I felt clear. I couldn't take it anymore. I don't think it didn't feel like I was doing it from love, but I, it, it was self-love. I think it was like, okay, fuck this, I'm done. So, um, yeah, I've come to understand some things, but that, uh, the thing you said about learning that it's false. That's what's come to be more real than anything. Uh, it's like with a lot of practice, okay, with this, a lot of practice. Oh, oh shit. That's not even real. Quit entertaining it. You know, I, <laughs> I'm a thought in the mind of love. What? What am I, well, how could that even be? So that's been really powerful to really just, it's like, okay, that's not true. Now what? Let's go on. So that, I don't know, that sounds so insignificant, could, but it's very how, powerful. How could you be anything but a thought of love in the mind, which is pure love? How could you be anything but love? Exactly. And, and as that seeps in a bit, it's like the rest is so obviously false. Such a big lie. Um, the thing you said, I just had this thought yesterday morning, brushing my teeth, you know, the great meditative states. And I was thinking that very thing about the those in the monasteries and stuff, the, 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 the real, the ones there for the real authentically um how how we are all held together with this love and that there are people we've never heard of or seen souls that are doing this and um that's what it is now that's what i have to do now i have no clue how it will look and i i don't think it'll look like anything uh except paying attention in the moment, it, uh, I'll, I'll know. Um, also realize as much as you need the monk in the monastery doing what he's doing, the dream of mind needs you doing what you're doing. Well, well it, that's exactly it. Mostly I was fascinated with the synchronicity because I just had that thought the other day and you brought that up. So that was to me, that's the divine breadcrumbs 
uh, from Hansel and Gretel saying, okay, there, there, here's this one mind thought. So those are, I always look at those, that Jungian synchronicity. Anyway, I, um, I'm going to stop now. Um, but I was given a, what Jesus called a mantra a couple of weeks ago, and it keeps coming back to me and, um, be still and know that I am now. And uh, that keeps unfolding for me. Um, yeah. Thank you. That's all. Thanks for sharing. I mean, and ultimately, the next step inwards is if Jesus is saying to you, be still and know I am now, where is Jesus but now? And where are you but now? And if both Jesus and you are but now, is there a Jesus and a you? Or there, is there just a now? And if there's just now, and now is another word for God, what is speaking to itself right now? Thank you. Marsha. <laughs> just look at the screen. No. I mean, do, look at the screen. Just all of you look at the screen. And I want you all to let's um I want you all to smell the roses in Lisa's Lisa Lisa's <laughs> Lisa's background. Can you all smell the roses? I want you to try and pick a rose. Scratch the screen and see if you can ruffle up the roses on Lisa's screen. <laughs> okay. Do you, do you feel the bumps on the screen where the roses are? Yeah. Can you feel? Can you feel uh, the roses? Yeah. Well, There's yeah. no roses. <laughs> but I can feel them. <laughs> There's no Lisa. There's no Lou. There's no Lloyd. There's no Steph. There's just one indivisible cell projecting all of his fractured cells experiencing the content of his dream through his projected selves. Each projected self has taken itself so personally, they've forgotten they are the projection of one indivisible Holy Son of God mind. There's only one of us on the screen right now. Mine is, of course, more special than the rest because, you know, I figured it out first. <laughs> <laughs> right right so i'm gonna start so you're going to attend my weekend retreat and you're going to all send me your money and i'm going to write a new book we're all the same we're just trying to <laughs> we can we're all just trying the best we can and some of us are going to appear a little bit more cooked than the rest but in truth one indivisible cell <laughs> if you were to meet me you would be disappointed <laughs> Marcia? Well, now you've made me want to have a cigarette, and I quit smoking 40 years ago. <laughs> Dang it all. Shit. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Marcia, I only started smoking in my late 40s, and the way I figured out by the time it's time for me to go, my lungs will be proper gone too anyway. So yeah. unlike everybody else that started smoking at 12 or 16. Right. You know, I'm hey, waiting for the now so I can handle it. Yeah, yeah. It's not going to catch up with you like it would with the rest of us, right? Yeah. <laughs> so my question is, um, I always thought I was this sweet, kind, peaceful person. Well, we all know what a bunch of shit that is. Now yeah. I've become this fiery, outspoken, opinionated person. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, and now you're talking about use what we are in our authenticity which I like to think that that's what I'm doing, but I'm still very, I back up and I go, what the hell did I say that for? You know, or why don't I just shut up and um, judge myself? So my big thing is on Facebook. Oh, that wonderful lesson of Facebook. I uh, live in the U.S., and uh, our nation is very divided right now. And I never was a political person, but I have become so um, on fire 
with, and I know the world's not real. I mean, I know all that, but you to back up to what I can do, how can I serve? What I serve, I think, is to slap pe people out of their somnolence. You know, there are, there are, I don't believe in good and evil. And yet within this dream, it seems that, that there's this dichotomy and I'm saying it's in the U S but it's all over the world. And what happens here is also what's happening everywhere. So I'm very outspoken about uh, political candidates and, and then I post really snarky, but very funny things about certain figures in the dream and then I feel guilty but what I'm thinking is that I, and I'm judging and I'm making it real but I think there's so many people that are asleep they gotta be slapped awake but but that's my judgment but then how do I tell if it's really my I feel like Joan of Arc on her horse with a flaming sword saying god damn it everybody wake up okay so I would just like to, because I still feel guilty for, for being worldly. Ah. ah. Ah, there's the rub. Okay, so once upon a time, the you know, the quiet Marcia. So once upon a time, you're a quiet little girl. And now, loud and obnoxious, and you're out there, and you're giving them slaps. And it'll slow down. The important thing is you're catching yourself. Oh, yeah. You're observing yourself behaving. And the important thing is to catch the sensation. Thought, feeling. Thoughts become sensations, become feelings, become emotions. What's playing out through you? And it's to catch yourself. Observe yourself acting. And where's this coming from? A place of love or a place of I've taken it seriously. I don't think this is right. And now I want to give it a counter reaction. Now, I'm not saying don't act because if you're acting from a place of love and you see an atrocity or you see something ugly, evil happening and you step in and you help by all means. But if you think that I'm pushing my by pushing your opinion, you're going to change minds. All you're going to do is get resistance. OK, yeah. I mean, you, you as Americans speak of your American political system as a disaster. The only reason you're aware of it is because it's in the surface in Africa. The same disaster is hidden. Mm. At least you guys can address it. You have a better political situation than the rest of the world, where in like Africa it's suppressed. You're unaware of what's going on. It's it's corrupt everywhere, okay? But here it's hidden, and it's and, and it's ugly, and it's ugly, ugly, okay? But anyway, the point is that the minute you've made it real, for you, you've reacted as if it's real. It's to catch your reaction and see how it's making you feel and then transcend. You're meant to play it out. You're meant to play out your desires for peace and stability and equality. Because by playing out your desires, you see the pointlessness and the futility of the desire. And the minute you see the futility of the desire, you catch the self. So it's to do whatever you need to do, but remain vigilant until you return to silence. You will, will return to silence. You have to get out there and, 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 and express because it's calling you to express in order for you to realize that even all expressions are pointless unless it's just pure love. So play it out until you burnt it out. It's like crying until you've got no more tears. Shout until you've got no more voice. Act until you've got no more acts to play. And then you'll settle in the truth and you will subside. But you have to burn it out. Yeah. As long as you remain vigilant to self and allow the self to be the observer of the thoughts, sensations, feelings, emotions, it will bring you back. It will bring you back because you've asked and you will receive. You've asked. That's great. You've Thank asked. you. That's great. Yeah. And I have to burn it. I have to let it just burn yeah. out. Yeah, that's yeah. really good. It's funny yeah. while we're talking, my tongue is tingling. I'm getting like kind of like all dizzy and funny. 
Could, yeah. could you just talk about the kind of physical things that go on? Just when say, we welcome, start? Holy Spirit, welcome. Yeah, so the physical, I mean, we're not a body, so how can we have physical stuff? But I've been noticing that as I essence, kind of go up the ladder, I get... you the filter filtration device called body-mind, the essence of love through the body-mind filtration is the expression of joy. And it can't be contained. And it's tingling because you're trying to contain it. Let it out. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Oh, most welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Marcia. Okay, Joanne, go ahead and unmute yourself. I think I am. Can you hear me? Yes, we yeah. can. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so Lou knows me pretty well. So I'm also at this point where, what now? Okay. And this thought that came to me the other day was, it's time to go out and play in your feminine role. Now, yeah. it's been more part of my life to be in a masculine role, mm -hmm. as much as I'm, I think I'm more feminine. But I don't understand what that means because I, it's it's not a, it's not part of, this it's not part of the physicality oh. there's another meaning to this and I'm, i can't quite put my finger on it so perhaps you can help me yeah it's go be light go be fun go 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 be gentle go go you've been you've been you've been so responsible for so many years taking care of so many people for so many years carrying the weight of family and responsibility business for so many years when I remember, you know how I feel about self-love. Self-love is total bullshit. Self-love is an ego concept. Can't self-love. There is no oh. self to love. There is just love. It's self-aware, love awareness. There's no self to love. There's love to be expressed, love to be shared. And it's good. And in your case, You've had to be so directive and so methodical and so strategic, which wasn't natural to you. It's now put that down and just go play. Go have some you fun know, again. All, all those qualities that you talk about, you know, at this point, um, almost seem more of a feminine nature. Yeah. You know, the love, the compassion, you know, not to say that it isn't of a masculine energy, but it just somehow seems more. So I don't know if there's a bit of play on words of it. No, it's just it. it's also it's also just be the balance, you know, and the balance is the masculine and the feminine, the yin yang are one indivisible self. You mm -hmm. know, you need the polarity in order to find, you know, we, we speak of balance. It's not about balance, it's about harmony. If you look at if a, if a, if a song was in balance, it would just be one one gong. You know, uh, om is in balance. A song is up and down. It's it it's ebbs and tides. It's the flow. It's rhythm. It's go be yourself as lovingly as you can. You've already established what's true and what's not true for you. You've already established the sense of self. Go share self in the gentle Joan way. Thank you. And don't forget to laugh. The discernment is there. And 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 don't get back into worry. Yes, you've made some mistakes. Sure, who hasn't? But now you're you're no longer that person that's going to draw those attack thoughts back into your space time. It's now go trust the love of God you are. Makes sense. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, it's makes sense because it's it's now moving out, out of thought senses feelings and emotions into sense awareness yes. sense awareness mm -hmm. because we are sentient essence energy so it's sense awareness we make we now make sense of it. sense and sensibility Thank you. don't trust me i don't know what the hell i'm talking about i don't know shit <laughs> <laughs> come on dude i'm not like the rest of you guys Okay, at this point, uh, Lou, we're, what we're going to do now, we're actually going to stop the recording. Wait, we're not going not anywhere. Yet. I got okay. one more question. Yeah, Lloyd, Lloyd has a question. Sorry. Um, 
now it took my mind out to question. Oh, I'm um, sure it'll come back, um, Carolyn. I don't <laughs> doubt for one minute it's going to come back. Let me just turn this down. Yeah. What the hell was it now? I lost. Just give it a moment. It'll I lost it. All right. Shall I shall I talk about something while you while you're um remembering? Yes. I know it is. I'm always forgetting Please. things myself. Then then one minute ago on the next. This is a massive question. This is a couple of points I wanted to make about something what Louis Luigi said in his talk about consciousness being everywhere. Like the general idea, like we've all got a consciousness, like that's my consciousness, your consciousness. Consciousness is everywhere. Everything's consciousness, like he said. Science has only just caught up with that. Yep. You know, I, I saw this documentary about a remote, I think it was a CIA or some other dubious organization. Anyway, they were thinking of getting remote yeah. viewers and getting them to remotely go into someone's office and spy on them. No, this kind of idea that they come out with. And then they figured out, well, the remote viewer said, well, where do you want me to go? Oh, um, okay. Then they had to look into some guy called Stephen Hawking. Uh, no, David Hawking. I think it's David Hawkins. Anyway, and he discovered that con he's discovered in science and quantum physics that consciousness is actually everywhere. And if you can get the right coordinates, they can point your mind over to where these people actually are. Now, whether they can do that, I don't know. I'm not a remote viewer, you know. But apparently, so that's what they're doing now. They're using coordinates to 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 use the overall consciousness to do this spying. Yeah. So really, it's an accepted fact now, by even by science, that consciousness is everywhere. Yeah. You know, it isn't just us talking. It's they're, they're, They know about this now. And the other yeah. point I wanted to make <laughs> was when you said about this, this CEO, like CEO, he, he's exhausted, he's burnt himself out, he retires, two years later he's dead. That reminded me of something I read about bees. Now, occasionally you see little worker bees walking. Was, as a kid, I was like, why is this bee, you know, knock them about, go on, take off, fly? Like, they're not going to go anywhere, they're just walking around. And I remember looking into it as a kid, and it turns out that worker bees have a certain lifespan. And they, when yeah. they get to the end of this lifespan, they automatically die. Well, sometimes it goes wrong, and they don't die. But they sort of know that they're supposed to be, they're not supposed to be doing their job anymore, and they should even stop flying. They just wander about until they conk out. And I suppose really that's a lot, one of life's great clues, if you look for them, that that's what, you know, you're working, you're a CEO, you've had enough, you're burnt out, have a wander around like the bee and then just conk out because that's the way of nature here. It's a natural yep. thing to do. <laughs> so that's, that's the points I was going to make really about the bee and about what you said about consciousness. I mean, that's like them, that science is lagging behind spirituality. It always has done, but it's caught up with it now, you know, and I yeah. thought that was just a good point to make. You made some great points, mate. I really enjoyed that. That's all I wanted to say. Yeah. I mean, as a, as a kid, I used to wonder how come, I could hear what people were thinking and see the images in their heads and it didn't take any effort. It was just completely natural for me. And it, it just, it, it really, I mean, as a young boy, it freaked me out when I realized other people couldn't do it either, you know, because people would say to me, why aren't you saying anything? I said, well, I just told you, yeah, but you didn't open your mouth. I mean, I just told you, yeah, but you got to speak. And I said, but you didn't say anything. And I know what you're thinking. And I would just freak people out. And of course, as I realized that everybody didn't do the same, that then made me withdraw. But many years later, a friend of mine was doing some, I was a varsity student and a friend of mine was doing his thesis on, on, on thought waves. And um, they asked for a bunch of students to participate. And I was really interested in, in, in a Christy Brink, Brinkley lookalike and she was going. So I attended and they put this device on me and then I had a look at a bunch of cards, you know, and, and the person in the next room was trying, was supposed to now imagine through my mind and read the cards. And of course, nobody got anything right. And then it was my turn, you know, and as they pulled out the card, I could see it instantly, like just because I'm seeing it, I'm seeing what they're thinking. And I freaked them out and they were watching my brain patterns Anyway, long story short, we then did a very a series of experiments where they were just looking at the cards. And if they looked at the cards and didn't visualize it, I couldn't see it. But the minute they visualized something, I could see it. So if it's in the cortex, if it's in the collective mind, it's immediately accessible to me. Why? Because I didn't drink any of that forgetfulness juice before I came to Earth. You know, I, I, did, I skipped the queue and I just went straight back down the tunnel. So I didn't drink any of the amnesia stuff. So 
Why? Because someone had to. The mind decided to play a trick on itself and and project something into form that was going to break some of the rules. Now, subsequently, I've met many others like myself. But there's the trick. The trick is that as soon as you start figuring out and you start to realize all of it is one indivisible mind, the ego took that in my early 20s and I decided to use it for business. So I could sit in any boardroom, do a presentation. I knew exactly what everybody was thinking. I could turn it and direct it in whichever way I wanted to. I'd always get the deal. And by the time I was 29, I was a millionaire. And then balance came yeah. back and gave me a proper tumor by the time I was 33, because what was I doing with all that energy? Using it for all the wrong reasons. So it's all got a, yeah. a play. It's yeah. all got a play. And it just traps us in, I mean, I've watched some of my scientific friends get so caught up in quantum and quantum thermodynamics um, that they they can't see the wood for the trees. I will never mind the matter in it. <laughs> They've just completely gone down. And and I'm seeing it now. I'm, I'm listening to many uh, um, quantum physicists. They're realizing that matter doesn't exist. Space time is an illusion. And the whole thing is mind. And it was, yeah, they're catching up. Wonderful. The problem is, what do we do with it? You know, so now what do we do with it? Now we know that everything is consciousness. What do we do with it? Aha. And all that will happen is some ego will take it and devise a way to rule the world. Well, like this remote control, like it's the CIA, let's get some remote control, remote viewers, and send them over yeah. there to listen to what they're saying, yeah. then come back and tell us. You know, it's so typical, isn't it? <laughs> you know, incidentally, incidentally, I've got this habit, like when I remember, like I'm in a supermarket or I'm out, and I just bless people with me. My, sometimes I say it, sometimes I think it as they go past. But I was standing there outside of Texas Steakhouse, me and my wife waiting for the people to come out. And I, as they were coming out, I was meant to go and bless you, sister, bless you, brother. And I meant to say, bless you, sister, to a woman walking out. She looked at me and said, thank you, and carried on walking. <laughs> Hey, did I did I say it? Or I didn't say it. Yeah, that's I it. Didn't, but she definitely turned her head and said thank you and just carried on walking. I was brilliant. I thought made my day that did actually. <laughs> there you go. It's yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to say something about remote view. I studied remote viewing for about five years. Okay. Oh right. And uh you know, I this is before the course even, and then I suddenly realized one day how remote view works. There's only one mind. There's only one mind. And I've had experiences where once I was talking to a lady friend in England, and I'm over here in Ontario, and all of a sudden she's describing the scene outside my window. And I mean completely. There was two or three different horses there. They were different colors. She was telling me the different colors. Mm -hmm. And I don't even think she realized this. But it was just another way of however the mind works to show me that there's really only one set of eyes here. It sees everything, one mind. And you know, remote viewing is it's not that complicated when you really understand there's only one mind. Sure. And I can't believe it took me half my life to figure that out, even though I was already doing it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's why, they're, in truth, they're actually, you know, when these, there's no secret thoughts, how can there be? There's only one freaking mind, right? <laughs> and there's and none of the thoughts are real, so there's no secret. None of thoughts are real, yeah. <laughs> this one, I, I remembered what I was, wanted to ask you was, why do you think, uh, I find anyway, that within the course community, there's so much emphasis on healing the body. Because <laughs> I know that's a stupid question. But... No, it's a great question. And it's a, it's it's exactly the problem is because we haven't fully comprehended the non-duality of it. And right. there's still a lot of course community groups that get very upset with me when I say course in miracles is complete non-duality, right? Unity awareness at one mint atonement one yep. you know and so what's happening is people are now turning the course of miracles into another religious group it's becoming the next religion and you know you now have reverends and you've got churches and monasteries and before you know it you're going to have cathedrals and there's going to be a bishop and fuck it what else you know 
Um, it's Thank just a matter true. of time, you know. Mm. Um, it's just a matter of time. Why? Because it's such a powerful book. And because Christianity is losing its grip on reality, more, more people are looking for an alternative. But one of the biggest mistakes we make is we don't realize, I mean, I know we've had, Steve, you've spoken about it, Lloyd, you've spoken about it um, many a time, is that the course is taught at different layers of level. And that's why it sometimes sounds contradictory because at this level, it's Jesus holding your hand and Jesus walking with you and, and Jesus and Jesus and Jesus in that time. In the next level, it's Christ's mind talking with you, Holy Spirit reminding you. It's your dialogue with Holy Spirit. And in that time, at that stage, it's you and God. It's just you and I and my Father are one. And, and we're meant to be transcending it. But what we have is certain course communities and certain teachers ensuring that everybody stays there because they need the... They need the follow. They need the followers. They need the money. They need the funds. They've turned the course into into money. They've turned it into money making business. So they need you to stay there, and they need to attract more followers. So they keep teaching at the bottom level of the of the ladder, and they're not letting people transcend it. One of the greatest compliments a student could give me is to say to me, "Lou, we don't need you anymore." Right. You know, I just a, a student of mine, a student, excuse the term, because no right to call them a student, but someone that followed me for a while told me yesterday that she didn't need me anymore. That was it. You, it was the greatest what? compliment you could ever gave me. I mean, I cried for four hours after that, but I was fine. After you know, <laughs> after I was fine. You know, because but the no, <laughs> the point is what I can't it, tell you what a great gift that was. It's 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 when I say to someone. That's why I'm still single. I love you, but I don't need you. Yeah. Right. It's the greatest compliment I give you. I love you, but I don't need you. There's nothing you can do that I need. I, the love I am recognizes the love you are. Love is the absence of space time. Love is the absence of body. Love is the essence of what you are. The love I am recognizes the love you are. Why is it that we're not getting it? Because we don't want others to get it. We need to be on the pedestal. It's not rise above the battlefield. It's rise onto the pedestal. And, and I have been guided to be that voice of reason. I've been guided to be the, um, the provocateur sure. to go and scratch where angels dare not scratch because angels don't have fingers with which to scratch. So I scratch and some people get offended. It's like, you know, the bum cheek picture. The, you know, the Jesus picture where I posted the Jesus showing his bum. Nice. It upset lots of people. It was meant to upset you. But go and read the post. Okay? You're meant to get so upset that the fuck and what's this guy doing now? Because my original post was just going to be a pretty picture of Jesus' face, which everybody else does. But one of the things I try and teach you is God, guru, and self are one. And the minute you rank order them, you place a part of yourself above yourself and unattainable by the self you are. Now, like I said, new first-time student, he needs the Jesus. Jesus spoke to me, Jesus, Jesus. But have you guys noticed that in Ken Wapnick's 100,000, 2 and 6 billion videos, he never mentions once that Jesus told him anything. You notice then when Ken Wapnick spoke, he would refer to Jesus' as teachings, but would never say, Jesus told me. Please right. go take notes. Yeah. Yet nowadays people, I mean, your Christians are turning around and saying, oh, God spoke to me and Jesus spoke to me. And all it is is their own inner cook dialogue carrying on. And then they just make it special by saying, Jesus spoke to me. The course community is doing exactly the fucking same thing. Okay, you feel that passion coming out? I got to call you on that. I mean, at least say Christ spoke to me because Christ is our true self. That's accurate. That's true. Christ is always talking through you. You've actually never said a single word. You've never had a single thought. You are thought through. You are spoken through until you put the filter in the way. Until the goat persona comes in the way and now the light, the Christ is filtered through words. So what should be love says fuck. But fuck is love filtered when spoken with love. Uh, the word fuck is just fornicating under the consent of the king. It's an acronym. Nothing wrong with it. It's people that have a problem with the word fuck 
are people that have a problem with their sexuality. So when I say fuck, I just mean blah, blah, blah. they imagine sex and they have a problem with sexuality. So they find the word offensive. It's not my fucking problem. It's your shit. Practice forgiveness. I don't have a problem with fuck. You know, it's just a word. But some people, oh, that's not very spiritual. The whole entire fucking universe isn't spiritual. It's created in vengeance. What else do you want it to be? There's not a single thing in this universe which is made from love. Yet the essence of all of it is love. And this is love sharing love with you in a way that shakes that fucking tree. Because you've got enough of those. Would you prefer I spoke this way? <laughs> no. oh, Jesus spoke to me this morning and told me I was going to meet this beautiful group of ascended angels and one mad guy called Steve and the rest of them are just so happy and they're all trying would you feel better about yourselves now are you feeling more special now wake the fuck up come on that's the last thing you need I'm not here to appease your egoic sense of spiritual specialness I'm here to rock your foundation to realize that you are true to you, regardless of what I say. You reinforce self by disagreeing with me and being still. Or you reinforce itself by recognizing the truth that comes through me in a myriad of blah, 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 blah words, symbols twice removed. Because the truth is always there. At first, they were the fundamentalists, the Ken Wapniks. They came and they laid the foundation and they touched on the layers of the ladder, but they laid the foundation. Then you get the next bunch of teachers, the David Hofmeisters, the, the Gary Renards, and they just elevated and extended it. They did a great job and more and more teachers joined. And now you've got a whole new level coming through. And they are going to shake the tree with their diversity of teaching methods and yet the truth is in all of us. And remember, the difference between a teacher and a student is simply this. A teacher remembers by blah, 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 blah. Okay. And a student learns by listening. What's the difference? There's no difference. The teacher is way more fucked up. Why? Because the teacher needs hundreds of fractures of himself to remind himself of the self. I am. The student is quite happy just seeing one fracture. Teaching student relationships are maximal. The blah, blah, blahs, those that follow the jnani, the intellect, they go through hundreds of dark nights of the soul, hundreds of fifth level periods, hundreds. It's intense. Why? They have to go through it to bring it through authentically and share it through direct experience. Why do you think David Hofmeister shares through movies? Because David's had a very gentle, monolithic life. I don't need movies. I've lived the fucking things. <laughs> I have direct experience of a myriad of nightmares, which I can bring through my own direct experience through to you. We're all teaching exactly the same thing in a myriad of ways. Where the fuck do the smokers go? Where do the people that don't like holding hands and standing in circles singing Kumbaya, where do they go? They go to the badass club of Luji Puji, pudding and pie, where you can smoke and fly. I mean, because someone has to. And all I'm really doing is by just being authentic to this madness is giving other people permission to be the same. My The first person I ever listened to, of course, a miracle student a teacher, Greta from, from Holland. She lived in Australia, but she came from Holland. Mm -hmm. and, and she came and, and all our South Africans were so happy to meet a course teacher. We had never even heard of David or, or Gary. We hadn't heard of anybody. And there was this course teacher and there was this Dutch woman. And she just had a big, broad smile and eyes that could look through you. And she stood up on the podium. And the first thing she did when she opened her Falling Apart Course in Miracles book is she said, fuck this. And I went, thank you. You've just given me permission. Because for 10, 12 years, I had hidden from the world and stopped teaching. 
because I got to that point where I realized I don't know anything. Why should I say anything? And what gives me the authority on anything when I don't even know self? And so I stopped teaching until Greta stood up and said, fuck that. And I realized this South African persona of mine, which is only mostly animated when I'm teaching, when I'm quiet, when I'm in my own, when I'm with close friends and company, I hardly speak. I swear a lot more when I'm teaching than I do in everyday life because it's that's Holy Spirit flowing through me, making it accessible for those that have beaten themselves up for not being holy enough. And it's fun. Right. <laughs> that's beautiful. Yeah, but do we have time for one more question? One, there's, uh, Doreen had a Doreen had her hand up. Doreen, do you still have your hand up there? Yeah. Yeah, I have my hand up, but I thought, you know, we're going to the end. Is there still time for a question, Stephanie? Yes, I mean, if it's okay with Luigi, one more question is certainly okay well. with us. Because you had a question as well. No, it's all good. No, we, that's we already good. did that. We, we did, did that. that. Yeah? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, Louis, I just want to check if I have a, a correct understanding, more or less, about what it means when time implodes through forgiveness. Um, I saw the videos of Brian Green that he did 20 years ago. He was a, a physicist who made uh, quantum physics more um, well accessible for the public. And what I understand, but I would like to check it with you, is that when we forgive, um, and we truly forgive like Asim teaches us. So not forgive to, to uh, judge or <laughs> that kind of negative thing, but really forgiving. We enter into um, uh, a more positive timeline. And um, it seems like our life just improves a little bit more than it was before that time. I understand that all possibilities exist in the universe. So to me, it makes sense that forgiving gives us the ability to change timelines from one timeline to a timeline that is experienced a bit more harmonious than before. What would you say about that? Okay, I'm going to answer to you in an experiment. I want you to practice. I want you to try something with me and then I'll give you the explanation. I want you to take a really deep breath, really deep, fill your lungs up completely so that it becomes uncomfortable and keep it there. And when you can't keep it there anymore, exhale. Okay, now I want us to do it again. And as you inhale, follow the breath and center with the breath. Hold it. Center in the center. Exhale. Okay, now I want a really deep breath. And I want you to follow the breath all the way down to the very bottom of your lungs. Now, when you exhale, I want you to exhale from the center of your chest outwards. Extend it. Okay. Breathe in. As you center in the center. Center all the way to the center. What are the lungs? As you exhale, extend. Deep breath in. Fill those lungs. Center. Extend. Keep doing it. One more time. Deep breath in. Extend. Now I have a question for you. Doreen, how much thinking were you doing while you were doing the exercise? 
practically nothing, actually. There's your forgiveness lesson done. Mm. No thoughts, nothing to forgive. You've just collapsed space-time, no thought. The purpose of forgiveness mm. is to bring you to no thought. The breath brings you into no thought. It's not about the breathing. It's about the no thought. The purpose of forgiveness is to collapse subject object. This forgives that. There's something to forgive, someone to forgive, space distance between subject object. While you were breathing, no thought. That's the purpose of forgiveness. When you're in no thought, nothing to forgive, everything to extend. Time's collapsed. Mm -hmm. You are completely mm -hmm. centered. Now you know what centering means and spaciousness. No thought is spacious. Mm. That's what collapsing time feels and senses like for the body-mind. Now you understand mm. it. Now if you need to mm. intellectualize it so that you can mm. explain it, explain it from your direct experience where there wasn't a single thought. Mm. Yeah, got it. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Love it. Wow. Okay, so this feels like a good time to, to close. And uh, thank you so much again for joining us. Uh, I think it was going to be, it's going to be very helpful for many parts of the mind and, and parts of the mind, they're going to listen to it later. Uh, so I'm going to invite everyone now to take themselves off mute and just to thank, thank Luigi. Thank you, Luigi, so thank much. You. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was good. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.